Hello, everyone. Welcome to an exciting stream of Art Lounge Alley. This is uh, the project stream, but I have a special intro for you uh, today. This has been a long time coming. I spent a lot of time trying to put this together, uh, trying to put all the different artists and um, images together and all this stuff. So it took some time. Uh, I squeezed out whatever free time I had uh, to 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 get this done um, and introduce you guys to uh, one of my favorite artists. I'm going to show you who I'm talking about right now, actually. It is Gil Elfgren. Uh, he is a very famous and very prominent um, pinup artist. Now, be warned, this is... I'm going to say this rating for uh, the stream is going to be NC-17. You know, it does have a little bit of nudity there, uh, but I imagine that all you guys who are viewing this, you guys are mature and uh, you're able to look at this artistically, um, uh, which is really what it's all about. Uh, he captures um, the female figure in such an excellent way. Um, I mean, he shows their beauty, their femininity in a very beautiful way. And uh, you guys obviously could tell from the front, from the cover of it. Uh, and that's just the beginning. I mean, this book is pretty extensive. There's like a lot of stuff going on over there. And this is why um, I think this is going to take a lot of time. This is probably going to take up uh, the entire stream, maybe. I want to say maybe the first half is going to take up the entire stream. But this is going to be uh, divided into many different ones. I guess, uh, as I put it together, I'm not going to translate everything, but uh, image wise, it does go through periods, you know, it goes from like 20s, 30s, 40s, like it really shows um, the styles and a a how they changed as well as his style and how that's changed. Um, and of course, talking about all the different influences um, and all those artists, uh, I think it's important to highlight them as well and i think it's important to talk about them which is what this half of uh, the special intro is going to be i'm going to talk a little bit about elf um Gil elfgren and then i'm going to talk about the influences of his so you guys can get a better understanding of uh really what inspired him to do it and you guys um will get a pretty good insight and there's lots of artists uh, here you know i'm going to show you guys a good handful today and then there's going to be another half uh talking about them and pretty much through uh all of them but uh there isn't that much text in this book the thickness of it is just how much he painted you know he's an excellent painter this is oil painting uh he was also a photographer as well something i'm going to talk about for a little bit and you guys are going to get to see um some of the images and just see, compare and um notice the process and like what are the things that he did to kind of change things around um and he's also the reason why i really like him as an artist is because he's another artist just like john buscemo is able to kind of capture uh both like realism and as well as it's stylized like you guys will see from the photos in comparison to his paintings that it is stylized the way that the uh, women look they're a bit exaggerated like the their eyes for example or certain features they're a little bit more exaggerated so he has like this pretty good balance i, I don't want to say it's comic bookish but it does have a little bit of a fantastic uh element to it how he captures uh the female figures and their expressions and their features as well um so yeah he's another one of my favorite artists and who's able to kind of balance both and produce some amazing uh amazing work I'm just going to show you guys this is the beginning. And this is what I was talking about in terms of uh, era. You know, you could see that this the style um, and uh, I guess the pose even suggesting the pose um, and the hairstyle and um, the physique suggests something in the 20s. You know, I'm going to say 20s and 30s. And that's really what you're going to be seeing this uh, huge process all the way up to i'm going to say i don't know 60s i don't think it goes up as, as far as 70s um but 
uh, yeah, and there's going to be some work that I'm sure some of you have uh, come across before. Um, but I'm not going to go too much into this book just yet. I just want to introduce you guys first to uh, some of the artists that he's influenced by and just talk about a little bit about uh, Gil, Gil Elfgren himself. So this is the uh, legendary artist. This is Gil Elvgren, as you can see on the left side. Uh, he was born in 1914 and he was active. So I guess all the way up to the seventies as well, um, all the way up to 1980. Um, he was the most important pinup and uh, glamor artist of the 20th century. Uh, one of his most recognizable works is from his Coca-Cola illustrations. Uh, Elvgren's Coca-Cola subjects portrayed the American dream of a secure, comfortable lifestyle. But his well-known illustrations for magazine stories often captured timeless scenes that reflected the hopes, fears, and joys of their readers. In the field of advertising, alongside his Coca-Cola work, he contributed to campaigns for prominent American companies and products such as Orange Crush, Schilt's Beer, Sealy Mattress, General Electric, uh, Sylvania, and Napa Auto Parts. With his work from Brown and Bigelow and the Coca-Cola and other national advertising assignments, um, and his magazine work, Alf Grin was much in demand as an artist. Uh, his time booked up more than a year ahead of his output. So that's that's something to note. I mean, that's how much he dedicated himself to uh, to painting and to drawing, and uh, that's the kind of result that he had uh, was was that he was in really high demand. And I think it's also important to note uh, the time and era. You know, that comparison to now, right? I mean, uh, really. I think artists at that time had to, and I think economically, they were able to dedicate more of their time uh, to hone their craft, to really get uh, better. And uh, yeah, um, I think that's really what uh, put pushed them out there. And as well as there was no such thing as internet, you know, so I think that uh, the selections had to be made locally of course and it was just word of mouth and how much the person put them out uh put themselves out there so um i think it was just a different time era um and because of that and because he was so because there were a, a lot of great artists i'm sure uh but because um there was no internet like that there was no way to to advertise yourself or anything like that it was a, a little bit more of a difficult thing so um, it really depended on the person to uh, put themselves out there to promote themselves and to make connections with people and um, put in a lot of time towards their craft and yeah I think a lot of it also had to do with the economy and how much um, people were able to save and how much of their time they were able to dedicate to hone in their craft as opposed to like how it is now where you know you're chasing uh, any sort of job or whatever like the average person is working uh, a job that is incapable of paying for his bills and his rent like as i mentioned before federal minimum wage hasn't raised since 2009 while everything else has been constantly going up and uh, as far as inflation goes uh so you know less and less chance for you to be able to um really sit and dedicate yourself to things you're constantly thinking about bills or if you're not you have barely any time to uh, really enjoy yourself. So it was just a different era, I want to say, and that kind of uh, played into uh, how often he got booked and how much time he spent in de developing uh, his craft. But what you guys are also going to be seeing, you know, this is just an intro image that I'm going to be showing you guys through the slideshow. I'm going to be showing you more images and just talking about them. Um, you're you're going to be seeing all different types of work. Uh, and different sort of um, 
uh, poses and different sorts of colors and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, what he also was able to do with, um, with that was that he was able to uh, take photographs. Like he was not only known for being uh, um, a painter, he was also known for being a photographer. And you guys will see that in the slideshow as well. Um, so uh, long before he attended his first art class in 1933, Elfgren had been impressed by the early Pretty Girl illustrators like Charles Donna Gibson, Howard Chandler Christie, Harrison Fisher, as well as McLellan Barkley, Haddon H. Sundblom, Andrew Loomis, which is another great artist that I, I really like, uh, Charles E. Chambers, and Pruitt Carter. So all these artists played a really important role um, in his in his uh, aspiration to becoming a, one of the most recognizable and one of the best, I'm going to say, um, or not even best, but just really amazing pinup artists. You know, I think every artist, and as you guys will see uh, through all these different types, that they all had their own beauty. There isn't like best or worst, really, when it comes to it. They all had their own style. They all, they all had their own uniqueness. So I'm just going to say he was a really amazing uh, pinup artist. Um, I personally am very much attracted to his style, very much attracted to uh, his technique and, and um, his portrayal of the female figure and poses and expressions and so on. All right, so uh, let's explore these illustrators. Um, I'm going to show you guys first like a quick snippet of his works right here um so this one is pretty suggestive i, I want to say i like that uh, of course you could tell by uh the pose that she's in but also what jack in a box represents so it's a little bit of an in innuendo there um and for that time this was considered to be very provocative too like this is uh, an image from 1950. So this isn't really a chronological order. This is just to give you guys an overview of of his work and um, all the different paintings that he's done. And this is another one, and this is the same idea as well. Like the goose really is supposed to represent a very, I'm gonna say it's like a phallic sort of symbol in this example, and. Um, you know the aggression coming from him um and of course her exposing her legs and it's just like an excuse to kind of show that right like this combination uh is just a clever way of um bringing on more of like a sexual context to it all uh, but notice just how well it's all done like how well he transitions the colors like it really pops out it looks like a photograph if you look at the detail of her legs not only is he able to capture the femininity of the legs and the lines and um uh all the suggestiveness that comes with it but uh just how he paints it and just the subtlety in some of the uh shadows you know if you look at the thigh for example um the right on the right leg there's a slight shadow there to show a little bit of the muscle so it's not incredibly muscular but uh, through his paintwork he's su suggesting very toned legs and uh, just looking at the skin tone as well like being able to do that and to create that three dimension to blend all these colors so well together and not only that but capturing the light uh, the right uh, the right tone is ex extremely well done. Uh, so for those of you who have tried oil painting, you could recognize how difficult it can be uh, to do that. You know, this does take a lot of time, a lot of dedication and practice and uh, trial and error in order to be able to get such a thing, especially when it comes to skin tone. Um, but as you could see, you know, there is, it almost seems effortless. And there's a se sense of like fluidity to all of his lines and like looking at the dress and all the folds that are on the dress. Uh, everything has this very natural sort of 
uh, element to it, as well as the goose himself. You know, if you look at the feathers, like there's all that texture showing on the back, on his feathers, uh, on his wings. I mean, uh, there's all that there as well. And it also shows um, this like very natural element. There's nothing rigid or nothing stiff about any of this, you know, as far as her pose goes, as far as uh, the texture goes, as far as like the material that goes and even the backgrounds. Like if you look at the bottom where the flowers are and the trees as well, there's this like very natural fluidity uh, to to everything that he's done. So very well done compositionally, you know, as of course the uh, use of yellows, like from the flowers, the use of yellows and reds basically. So from the flowers, uh, the red of the flowers, then you have like the skin tone that is kind of like in between both. You could see a little bit of red there in shadows. You could see a little bit of yellow. Of course, the red and yellow of her lips and hair, and then uh, the goose having the beak and his feet kind of. So overall, it just kind of goes all the way around to the flowers that are on the bottom right corner, um, as well as her shoes have that red. So it's just this ongoing sort of uh, theme that's, that's in this image so you could see that he is well-rounded all um you know he's able to capture uh animals he's able to capture uh, obviously the female figure well he's very good at composition he's able to create uh an interesting uh scene you know a very suggestive one uh using these two uh subjects and then moving on to this one which I personally really like as well. This is a good one. This is like a disgruntled, beautiful wife uh, who's looking at the time uh, of her husband's arrival, right? And she's like, you know, it's it's 2 a.m. Where have you been? She's holding this, um, I forget what it's called. Um, anyways, yeah, it su suggests that she's pissed, uh, but also still very suggestive as well, you know, like what she's wearing. Um, and for this one, I think what's great is the use of color. Like, um, and you'll see that as a repeating theme for him. So you could see how well-rounded he is in everything. Like, you know, just coming up with scenarios, coming up with beautiful colors and combinations, um, painting, being able to paint everything. Um, like this gown that she's wearing, the fact that he was able to paint it in a way that shows it's transparent um and still kind of have like the skin tone beneath it so it's just great work in terms of being able to mix colors um anatomy you know he has that down uh the use of colors as i mentioned uh composition is excellent um and you guys will see through his influences how that how each artist kind of plays into it and how it's kind of different, you know, from that era um, and his use of color and how unique it is in comparison to his influences. This is another one. This is a beautiful one. I think uh, just being able to, again, capture um, the female figure. And again, there's something really, what I really like about his work is that it's not overtly sexual, right? It's just suggestive. It's like it leaves it up to the imagination, kind of, you're not seeing the woman totally nude and she's not exposing herself in like this uh aggressive way or anything but it's it's light-hearted but at the same time it's seductive you know so i think he's able to really play that middle ground uh pretty well um once again if you look at her shoes right very bright colors um and use of light source as well as you could see on her legs to suggest that the light source is further back out uh, but she's still in pretty bright light so it's this interesting combination of both like the room is very dark but she's in a very bright light uh, which i think is like more of a stylistic choice uh, to really pop out a figure and pop out the subject uh, more so This, uh, I think, is a really beautiful painting as well because it shows 
how well he's able to combine colors you know from the earrings to her lipstick to her hair and the various colors used in the hair um to give this like sort of very uh pop art element to it which i really like and then just looking at uh the skin tone and how he uses all these different uh colors as well like you could see the yellow for the reflective light that he uses and he combines that very well with uh more of like i want to say cadman yellow and uh all the flesh tones combined and how he's able to mix those very well um again excellent use of uh, white and understanding like all the folds on the material itself and very bright background um so all of it combined together uh as well as her eyes so like the background kind of is like a bluish green which works well with the color of her eyes and the earrings and uh of course the lips being like kind of the center focus um because of how bright they are but really it's just done so well all around that your eye does want to explore the entire drawing uh as well as like looking at the anatomy of the hand you know the hand is also kind of expressive both hands are expressive one suggests um a little bit more of a feminine expression while the other one is like kind of trying to grasp at whatever is around um showing a bit of alarm um and of course the face suggesting the same thing this is just to demonstrate that he's not only a great painter but he's also excellent at drawing um and even though this isn't one of his like seductive kind of drawings you could see he's able to really breathe life into a drawing like this person's actually looking back at you and it's not a drawing that you're kind of in the same room uh, with this person um i think it's very well it's just a um, demonstration of how well in tune he is with drawing and painting and just the art uh field i want to say um moving on to this one another beautiful painting demonstrating his um really skillful talent and understanding of uh, light source understanding of colors you know i really like the background and how it transitions from like a greenish blue all the way down to like um like an aquamarine blue mixed in with gray um and how that works so well with the entire drawing with the red like you could see that they're all kind of in a very um in the same tone range you know that uh, the reds um and the greens and the orange are kind of in the same uh, yeah in the same tone range there Yet another one that's a close-up uh, to show how well he understands the face, uh, how well he's able to uh, capture an expression as well. Um, and I really like how he drew the lips here as well, he, how he painted them, and they really pop out um, on a painting. But again, also great choice of colors uh, from that green to the yellow and the color, the red color of her hair. And you could see like the little accent marks, like the yellow accent marks to show highlight. And it's just a brush stroke. You know, sometimes, um, when you guys are watching me draw, or if you're watching somebody else draw, like there's this meticulousness, right? Of like trying to draw the strands or trying to draw the highlights. Whereas in this painting, you could see just simple one, brush stroke like a simple brush stroke for um highlights for let's say like the top left part of her hair you could see that the brush stroke there and then one below it as well it's just one simple stroke but he understands uh highlights so well he understands light s source so well that uh he can really just do that and it and it makes sense you know it really plays into uh the painting um 
And as you could see in this drawing, and you guys will see further on in comparison to photos, that there is a little bit of, there is style to it. Like there is something fantastical about their face. You know, their eyes are so expressive and I want to say they're slightly exaggerated. Um, but yet still retains a very three-dimensional realistic sort of vibe. another beautiful painting. Um, what really pops out for me is the folds on a dress. It, it really looks uh, three-dimensional. Like he really was able to, uh, again, capture that flow, flowing sort of element. You know, there's realism to it. Um, it seems to really rest well on the body. It's not uh, angular, There, it's not uh, rigid, it's not uh, stiff in any way, there's this like natural flow to it. Uh, and he was really able to capture that, as well as like the folds and the shadows that are forming um, inside of them. Like great use of color, he was able to really get that down as well. Um, and as well as the pose, like he was really he picked the right pose because all of this is his composition. Like he takes the time to uh, create the scene, to create the the suggestion of uh, of her pose and what she's doing, and also the look in her eyes, um, and of course the redness of her cheeks and uh, the redness of her lips is just kind of like combining it all together to, to give more of like a su su suggestive uh, vibe, you know, that she is kind of flushed, um, you know, that there is a little bit of, I guess, sexual tension there between the viewer and uh, the subject. And he, that's what he was aiming for. I mean, he's trying to draw the audience in. So just again, highlighting all these things, like understanding that element not only is it just about skill he's not just displaying skill here he's also um displaying his good understanding in storytelling and uh being able to draw the viewer to the subject and having it all harmoniously connect you know from her face expression to what the subject or what she's doing uh to little elements like putting a little bit more red in her cheeks to suggest that she is uh, a more, um, I guess, aroused in some way or feeling sexual tension um, to, like, the exposure of her legs. Again, at the time, this was considered to be very provocative. Uh, women weren't wearing short, short skirts or mini skirts or anything like that. So all of that combined together as well as like a very beautiful um, scene in the background uh, says the same thing and what we usually associate people picking at uh, dandelion petis, um, um, petals you know they're usually playing a game of something that has to deal with romance right like she loves me she loves me not or whatever so this this kind of uh, suggests that same thing And here's an example of the models that he used and how he was composing a lot of the drawings or paintings rather. And uh, as you could see, when it comes to the face, it's not exactly the same sort of features, but he ends up changing things around to his liking. So he's not just copying the models, he's also using his uh, creativity, his imagination, his understanding of, uh, you know, more of like an illustrious kind of look and suggestiveness and he puts that all together so there is there is a difference there between just taking photos and copying them and being able to play with them in a way of creating your own unique uh, work you guys will see that here as well uh, and I believe the next photo is going to do the same thing and it's going to give you like a comparison side by side to show you um, what that looked like. Here's another one. This is his photographs as well. So 
So just pay attention to, for instance, their eyes, right? When you're looking at their eyes and then looking at the paintings, you'll see that he does give them a little bit more exaggeration. But everything from like, you know, like looking at her hands, like that's also something that he composed. Like, so he composed a lot of these uh, scenes and what he wanted them to look like, what it exactly, how they want, how he wanted them to display themselves, that sort of thing. And here's an example. So you could see side by side uh, how much he used exactly from the photo and how much um, he did from his imagination. So you could see in her face, again, uh, there's a lot of exaggeration there. The hair, right? If you look at her hair and the photo, there's more volume in a painting as opposed to in a photo. Uh, as well as her face expression is a lot more uh, excited, I want to say, on in the painting as opposed to in the photo itself. Like you could see her eyebrows are more raised and uh, how she's smiling is slightly different as well. So, um, of course, the eyes are exaggerated, as you could tell there. But the pose is very much similar. Uh, he changed the position of the hand, um, or the arm rather, or that could have been a, something that she, she changed over time. Uh, who, who knows? But you could see a lot of uh, the difference, like the shirt as well. That's something that he exaggerated. Of course, the size of her chest, that's also exaggerated. Um, the the top that she's wearing that's something that he um, fluffed up you know all everything has a little bit more bounce and um i guess flair to it as opposed to the actual photo itself all the way down to the heel like if you look at her heel uh it's very pointy at uh, in the painting as opposed to um, how it looks in real life. Again, beautiful. Um, demonstration of use of color, his painting ability, his understanding of skin tone, um, and the, the feminine expression of the pose. And color in the background, like the blue, is um, very complementary with the white and red. And of course, the color of her hair. They're all, they're all very illustrious colors. This is something I wanted to include because he did a lot of work with Coca-Cola. In fact, a lot of these artists, you could notice as I talk about them more, they they worked in the same kind of companies, you know. So I think it was again, it was like a word of mouth, a certain or these companies really favored illustrators and artists, and they wanted to give them an opportunity to uh, display their work, or rather, they were so great at what they were doing that it made their products look even better so it wasn't so much an opportunity they just saw that hey this is going to really bring attraction to uh, our products it's going to bring a lot of people in so we might as well as hire them and get them to to do that for us so you're going to see that a lot of the influenced artists uh also worked in coca-cola they also worked for cosmopolitan and uh, uh, you'll notice like repeating companies that are hiring these artists and we're back to the front um so yeah let's that's skill elfgren's work so let's took, take a look at um the first artist that was mentioned and he plays a very important role in illustration and uh, that is uh, charles donna gibson so 1883 1941 and uh, Gil Elfgren was like let's take a look here 1914 and he didn't start his class until 1933 so all this time you know he was really influenced by these 
uh, other artists from back then. Um, and yeah, Charles Donna Gibson is a very important uh, illustrator for the time because um, he was the first one to really uh, create like the pinup pinup girl, like of that era, you know, for that for that time period. Um, his representation of a pinup girl became uh, world known. And that's something that I'm going to talk about further, further on. Um, this is just going to be a brief overview of all of them. Um, but what you guys just saw, actually, this is the Gibson girl. This is the very first uh, pinup, I'm going to say, uh, that is well known. And it was worldwide. Everybody uh, recognized that it. it was printed on all sorts of things from umbrellas to like book covers to journal covers to a lot of things uh, that was used um and uh he yeah he kind of like pioneered that um and what's really cool is his work well a lot of the stuff that you're going to see is like pen and ink like he's so good at um being able to capture all these figures all these um expressions and face features uh, just using pen and ink. Um, you know, looking at this one here, uh, how he uses the lines. And the amazing thing about it, well, it's something that I didn't really think about, is that uh, pen and ink really gives you an opportunity to, uh, you know, create different types of shadows um, as opposed to like when you're using a pencil, you know, I think that there's permanence when it comes to a pen, obviously the lines are a lot darker. You can get richer shadows. You can get, um, you can make certain things pop out more. So you, you have kind of like, um, the line variation that you, uh, you have with pencil when it comes to pen and ink as well. Um, plus of course, being able to make those dark shadows, but he's able to really, um, create all these different like looking at the dress and you could see how he, just the use of the, the direction of the lines uh, he's suggesting you know something folding or something going to the left or the right side and I think it's very interesting to see what the style was like like a lot of this stuff is like you know you're jumping into a time machine and just traveling back to that era because this isn't it's not a, a fashion show this isn't people who are putting on clothes for like a photo shoot or something this is what people wore you know this is how people looked this is uh, what was considered to be it you know or fashionable or interesting or cool or whatever so it's it's very it's like looking at I don't know, uh, looking at like modern day magazines like US Weekly or something and looking at the styles there, uh, this is like an equivalent to it. Like this is what would be on there at for its time. Um, but I really, what I also really like about this photo is uh, the face expression. Like he was able to capture um, the hearty sort of vibe of this guy and as well as how um, precise those lines are to suggest the curvature to his cheeks and then for that to like transition to another plane right next to it and he's able to uh, to do that with all these lines like you could see the precision of all of them it's not as chaotic as let's say if you were to just step away and look at it without paying attention to the details like uh, once you do you could see how precise all those lines are uh, from the guy's hat all the way at the top left to the woman's hair all the way in the corner top right um, the, the precision of his lines is uh, amazing I'm gonna say it's very well done it's beautiful work uh, here's another demonstration of that and it's also cool to see the the hairstyle like that was considered to be um, you know, again, that's very fashionable. That is what I uh, was in, in that period. 
and this is just a photo of like high society you know again a demonstration of style um but also just to show his understanding of perspective as well how uh, they're placed so um so well in perspective from the chair to uh, the figures that are standing up and of course uh, the am amazing amount of uh, pen work there from the, the texture of the floor to the pants to her dress and the folds in the dress and uh, the suit that the pinstripe suit or what it seems like is pinstripe but really it could be just black um, and how he was able to play around with uh, shading there as well uh, to their face expression I really like the face expression of the woman on the bottom right um, how she's looking over to uh, I guess what it seems like she's displaying her dress you know how she's fashionably dressed and everybody's kind of admiring it everyone's looking over and seeing what she's wearing another cool scene uh, and this is supposed to be uh, I guess a maid that's imitating the woman of the house you know and they're just kind of having a laugh and how well she's able to do it but I really liked um, well I like the face expressions really on all of them I know he was able to capture it so beyond just rendering skills it just the emotion and also uh, the expressiveness of her hands like I really like that how one it, it kind of like looks like a fan almost one of the hands uh, looks fanned out but also has a bit of delicacy to it which is pretty cool And then this scene, they are only collecting the usual fans and gloves. Uh, and again, another scene from High Society. Um, and I want to say that this is this can be interpreted slightly political. You know, sometimes this was used as a way of talking about society and the economy of like how, you know, you got the rich people who are sitting at this beautiful table uh, and everything that's underneath is incredibly chaotic. So basically they're just like covering up uh, all the grime and all the dirt that's underneath that allowed them to actually sit and enjoy their meal on such a uh, fine table and such um, fine food and um, everything that comes with it. You know, so sometimes that's a, that's a way of displaying it. And I thought it was kind of interesting as an example of like how uh, it's disrupted, you know, that time is disrupted by them actually recognizing like oh crap there's all this stuff that's underneath that's brewing and we're gonna have to address it at some point point. and you can see all the women are kind of exiting which could suggest that they're not uh, they're not thrilled by their form of corruption and uh, they're just leaving them to uh, figuring it out So yep, that's uh, that's Charles Donna Gibson, uh, and I will be talking about him more in the future after um, I introduce all of these because you guys are going to hear their names very often throughout the other parts of uh, of the stream or the special intros. Uh, this is Howard Chandler Christie. Oh no. So uh, I did write a little bit more about them to give you guys a better understanding of each one of them. Um, so for Gibson, let's just go back real quick. For Charles Donna Gibson, we're going to say um, he started out at Life magazine in 1886 which uh, featured general interest articles, uh, humor, illustrations, and cartoons. His work appeared weekly in a popular national magazine for more than 30 years. Gibson soon found himself as an editor of, of Life magazine and later took over as owner. At the time of his death in 1944, he was considered the most celebrated pen and ink artist of his time, as well as a painter applauded by critics of his later work. Almost um, unrestricted 
merchandise saw his distinctive sketches appear in many forms. The Gibson uh, cocktail has been claimed to be named after him, as it is said that he favored ordering gin martinis with a pickled onion ra- uh, garnish in place of a traditional olive or lemon zest. So that's pretty interesting. I didn't know that. That, uh, whoa. Sorry, guys. This is uh, a little bit confusing there, but... Yeah, here's Charles Donna Gibson. Yeah, I didn't know about the Gibson was actually based off of him. And I have seen the Gibson girl before. I just uh, never really thought um, much about it. Or And it's just interesting how he's connected to one of my favorite artists. Um, so yeah, uh, going on, he's best known for his creation of the, the Gibson girl, an iconic representation of a beautiful and independent uh, Euro-American woman at the turn of the 20th century. He was also a student, and this is important, this is another thing that will pop up very often, you guys will see. He was also a student at the Art Students League of New York for two years. Um, Then we are moving on to Howard Chandler Christie. That's him right there. Uh, also a student at the Art Students League for one year. Um, so Char- Howard Chandler Christie was a fam- um, was famous for the Christie Girl. So following the Gibson Girl, he created the Christie Girl, uh, I guess, as something to challenge himself with to see if he can achieve that. Um, a colorful illustration successor to the Gibson Girl Christie is also widely known for his iconic World War I military recruitment and Liberty Loan posters, along with his 1940 masterpiece titled A Scene at the Signing of the Constitution of the United States, which is installed along the east stairwell of the United States Capitol. That's really interesting. Uh, So next time you guys ever do visit, um, well, I guess can't really see that um but it's cool to know that his work is still hanging up there uh so from 1920s until the early 1950s christie was active as a portrait painter whose uh, sitters included presidents senators industrialites uh, movie stars and socialites he painted lieutenant colonel uh, theodore roosevelt and president warren g harding Calvin Coolidge, Robert Hoover, Franklin Dillon Roosevelt, and Harry Truman. Other famous people he painted includes Benito Mussolini ugh, and Amelia Earnhardt, which is pretty cool. Uh, having made his reputation for his work as a combat artist in the support of uh, America's World War I efforts, Christie soon was illustrating for numerous mag covers he became famous for the Christie Girl, a picturesque and romantic type society woman, uniquely his own. His uh, work, whether in watercolor, oil, or pen and ink, is characterized by a great facility and dashing, but not uh, exaggerated style, a strong sense of values. Uh, so. That's Howard Chandler Christie, as you guys see, from 1872 to 1952. Um, and you could see, again, this is just like a pretty cool representation, but you could see how different that is in comparison to, for instance, the colors that Gil um, Elfgren was using. Uh, obviously, a lot more toned down, um, and the style is kind of different, but... Um, there's still richness of color to it, you know, in the browns that he uses, even in the skin tones um, that I want to say might have had an influence. I don't know exactly what uh, sort of things on there, but I'm just, I guess I'm just going based off of my uh, perception of what I think maybe Gil Elfgren was influenced by. It could be just how well uh, he was able to draw um, the figure, how well he was able to capture a likeness and breathe life into a painting. This, I want to say, like I try to do some research and find 
uh, the Christie girl in comparison to the Gibson girl, but uh, I'm going to say that he had many, and this is one of them. This is what I was mentioning um, earlier, what he was well known for, and of course, this is totally different uh, to what you saw in a previous one, where in, like the Gibson girls are very much like high society, lavishing looks, and like beautiful flowing dresses really expensive uh looking attire whereas this seems to be a little bit more tomboyish so you know again a woman who is more independent that she's not easily uh converted to like societal expectations so a little bit more of like a rebellious element but it's still elegant and uh has like a sense of intelligence and thoughtfulness in her expressions and you can kind of see that even in this painting here you know she doesn't have long hair she doesn't have like all these um lavishing sort of dresses and looks this is a little bit i want to say it's closer to what we would see as like a beatnik right it kind of has that vibe about it you can say this is like probably 20s early 1920s uh, but uh, beautiful color as well. Um, you can see how vibrant that is. And of course, he was able to really capture her face and the likeness. So it, you could see it's a painting, but still looking at the face, it seems like that person is, it's a photo or that person's really there. You know, you're just kind of looking at this uh, small window. a little bit of a mix I'm gonna say of like realism but also um, impressionism like the background if you look at the um, the green in the background there isn't really a, a lot of detail to it but it could have been done on purpose in order for the focal point to be on her um, and there aren't really that many hard edges here you can see it's very soft uh, brushwork you know from uh, her hat there's like softness going around the edges to her face to her clothes as well like all anything that you would see that has like an ed edge to it has a bit of a soft element to it even like the uh i don't know what it, what she's holding there i want to say it's some sort of jug uh it's like a chrome jug or whatnot but even that has a bit of softness to it as well like the around uh, the edges of the of the rim I'm going to say for this one, it's the same idea, um, very close to the description of like what his, um, what the females and his subjects, um, the choice of his, his subjects are uh, different from the previous one. So for instance, in, in terms of Gil Elfgren, right, like his women were a lot more sexual and there was a little bit more of a bubbly sort of element to them, whereas uh, these women also seem pretty bright, but more in the thoughtful and um, I'm going to say more of like mm, wistful sort of look about them. Um, more, a little bit more serious, of course, I mean, in comparison to Gil, Gil Elvgren and a little bit more, yeah, in thought in comparison to uh, Charles Donna Gibson's uh, women, you know, they were very posh and they were very like I'm high society sort of uh, vibe to them. Um, whereas these women tend, uh, seem to be, or his subjects seem, seem to be a little bit more down to earth. I want to say even starting from the very first painting. As you guys could see in these few all right, so moving on, and I'm looking at the time here. I think I'm going to have to just go over uh, how many. We'll see. I might have to even break this into a few. So next we got 
Harrison Fisher, 1875 to 1934. And uh, this is his work for the very popular Cosmopolitan. I'm going to go back on that one. So just to give you guys an overview of who Harrison Fisher was. So Harrison Fisher was at one time well known for his Fisher girl. So you could see that there's like this ongoing theme uh, that they're all kind of like trying to achieve what um, Charles Donna Gibson did. You know, as I mentioned, once he created the Gibson girl and how worldwide uh, it became, like I think it just uh, put more inspiration to all of these other artists to try to achieve that same level uh, of recognition, I guess. And at the time, the more of that, the more opportunities you get. So, um, and I think each one of them really did a good job at doing their own version of it or just capturing a certain time period. You know, of course, the Gibson girl isn't going to resemble the same ones as um, Harrison Fisher did because for him, it's a different kind of subject or a different type of interest. Uh, same thing for Howard Chandler Christie, like you saw the type of women that he was interested in and the sort of expressions that they carried. Um, but uh, yeah, Harrison Fisher was one of the, um, was at one time well known for his Fisher girl. Uh, Fisher made a name for himself in the history of American illustration due to his uncanny ability to paint beautiful women. His Fisher girl and his American girl were recognized as the epitome of feminine beauty. In America during the first quarter of the 20th century. She was lithe, elegant, and beautiful, but also athletic, independent, and intelligent. Cosmopolitan magazine in the 1920s called Harrison the world's greatest artist. Um, I don't know, you know, how exactly that's judged. Obviously, he's great, um, but I, I think there's a lot of favoritism that goes into it. There's a lot of like, you know, connection. Of course, there's people who fall in love with work. Um, I'm not going to knock it and say it's not worth praise. It's definitely great. It's beautiful work. Um, but as you could see, it's the same, uh, the same idea I was talking about how each one of them has their own subjects and, and each one of them has their own um, element, you know, or, or their own sort of mood or expression. So you could see uh, with Fisher's girls, they're more, they're like in between of Gibson, I want to say, and Christie. You know, there is style and elegance to them. There is a sense of confidence, right? You could see it in their face. They're a, a little bit less wistful. They, I think they're a little bit more, they kind of express a little bit more of um, self-awareness and um, a lot of confidence, right? In these expressive um, pieces but as you can see also very fashionable and um, interested in style great work of uh, watercolor you know it's still still a mystery to me uh, I think he really does a great job in terms of like especially with like uh, the tone range, right? If you look at her uh, coat, I guess, or what's, what she's draped in, it, there's a beautiful amount of variation when it comes to the colors there. Great way to capture a skin tone as well. He got that down. Um, and the hat. You could see the many range, uh, the many tone ranges there. So we're back at it. Um, there aren't, there wasn't that much that I could find on Harrison Fisher. So this is a little bit that I did find that I thought was a good demonstration of how beautiful his work is. Uh, so moving on, 
and this is probably going to be the last one for the stream everybody i'm going to come back to uh, the second half of this intro talking about a, f a f handful of other artists um this is McClelland Barclay, and I really like his work, actually. It's something about his um, style that really resonated with me, and I could see, actually, like, where and how it influenced uh, Gil Elfgren. Like, obviously, looking at this, very vibrant colors, right? And it's just interesting of how it transitioned, uh, or how different it is from the other ones, from, like, Harrison Fisher, and you saw his work. There's... Uh, his his colors were a little bit more subdued. Um, obviously, Gibson was pen and ink, and um, Howard Chandler Christie was a little bit more. Uh, there were more like earth tones, I want to say, uh, from what it, what I did notice. Whereas McClellan Barkley really, um, really went up there. You know that orange is very bright, and it works well with her lips and her hair. And of course, the green and the greenish blue that's around. And if you look at the hat, like you could see compositionally, it was really uh, well put together. Like the hat contains all of that. It has a little bit of red and kind of bordering orange uh, with the green and blue that's also in the backgrounds. Um, so just a little bit about McClellan Barclay. Uh, by the age of 21, Barclay's work had been published in... The Saturday Evening Post, Ladies Home Journal, and Cosmopolitan. Uh, he was, and just a quick side note, it's not to say, you know, oh, if you're not done by 21 and you're able to achieve that, then don't bother. It's just to say that this person really dedicated a lot of time and effort into uh, honing their craft, you know, so it's not, it's not really a competition in age, it's just to show uh, yeah, he was really focused at a very young age, and uh, I encourage everybody to, to do that, regardless of what their age is. It's just an attestment to where dedication gets you. It's not so much, oh, uh, you know, 21 is the mark. Uh, if you haven't reached publishing to these major, um, you know, uh, magazines or whatever, then forget it. Well, no, that's, that's not it. Um, but yeah, it's just really cool to know that uh, really, really pushed himself to the next level. Um, he was also a student at the Art Students League for a year where he studied figure drawing with uh, George Brigman. And that's a really important name to remember as well. And you'll see it repeating with all these other artists. So Art Students League is uh, quite reputable. Like it really has a very long history and has all these different artists that, attain, uh, that studied over there. And, and George Brigman also, like I've heard his name before multiple times when people talked about anatomy and learning from uh, his books. He has several published uh, talking about it. I've checked him out. I personally really like Andrew Loomis, you know, I'm over George Brigman, but uh, there are things to take away, I'm sure, from it. You know, and this is something that I checked out a long time ago. I haven't really explored it since. Uh, maybe, maybe my interest will change. Uh, but going on, in 1930, the General Motors Corporation selected Barclay's Fisher Body Girl. And I want to say, you know, I did a little bit of research to try to find uh, what that is, but I'm, what image that is. But I'm going to say this is it. You know, this is Fisher Body. This is his representation of the Fisher. This is his Fisher Girl. So, again, different style uh, in comparison to Christie, in comparison to... Um, um, Gibson um, and Fisher so this is this is his take on it and of that time and era and of his interest and of his style kind of it speaks for itself uh, but you could see it has kind of a, an illustration element to it so despite her having some three dimension to her the thick outlines kind of around her give a little bit more of like an illustration vibe and a combination of both like painting and illustration which I really like uh, I think it kind of reminds me a little bit of Adam Hughes. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he's a comic book artist and he kind of does like realistic uh, renditions of like superheroes, but he does that combination of like very realistic um, and these like outlines around them. 
So I want to say it remi reminds me a little bit of his work. Um, but yeah, this is his Fisher Girl. You know, I try to look for other ones, but I'm going to say all of them are kind of a representation of his interests. So looking at, at this subject, it's very different from, um, you know, the subject of Gibson. You know, what the, again, high society women wearing lavishing dresses. And um, I'm going to say it's a little bit more close to um, Christie, you know, his uh, subjects, because uh, they were a little bit more of, or removed from high society and just like have a little bit of, I want to say, a beat equality to them. You know, she's. A, she's interested in gardening and yet she does have a very delicate and model-esque face you know so um here's another example of his color choices as well like very bright colors um interesting choice between like the yellow the greenish blue right in the background with that green dress of hers and the red that uh, the other one is wearing and the leaves in the background. I thought it was a beautiful painting. Uh, very delicate features on a face as well. And the, the woman on the right kind of looks like a cherub. It's weird. It's a combination of like an adult and a baby. more of Barclay's um, beautiful color choices and you could see how that influenced I'm gonna say that's where I'm gonna say Elfgren's influence is is um, a little bit of that element of like illustration and realism right so what I was talking about before how like even going back to this one it's not hyper realistic but he's still able to capture life and he's able to capture expression and he, he does a very well uh, good job at rendering the face uh, to show like three dimension to it but still has quite like a painterly element to it um, and um, kind of like a comic bookish feel right like this could pass in a comic book I, I want to say this could be a panel in a comic book and, uh, and the choice of colors, you know, that's similar to Gil Elfgren's choice of colors of using very bright ones. Um, I'm going to say the light sources as well. Like you could see that it's also very bright light sources. And I just think that uh, he really captured a beautiful moment there with her face expression. Uh, there's a bit, there's like a sign of uh, peacefulness in her face uh, and kindness that he was able to get and I really like that you know it's not a photo where they're posing to be really seductive or dangerous or whatever you know like what you would see now on Instagram where everyone's like faking some sort of emotion or whatever like this is a genuine it feels like a very genuine moment that he was able to get and uh, it also expresses some sort of like deep connection uh, so I think that makes it very beautiful uh, it really lacks that like plastic quality I want to say when it comes to modern day photos like where people just kind of look like they're deer in the headlights despite them putting on very serious faces or very focused ones or very sensual ones there's still a sense of like emptiness to them whereas I think these paintings are really captured uh, beautiful moments and I think a lot of it also has to do with um, it being less saturated you know because there were no phones then people weren't able to just take selfies all day um it was a very special event to have like a portrait done of you or to have a photo done of you not everybody had the luxury or the opportunity or uh the chance to to be a subject of such things so when people really were captured either by painters or photographers you could see in their face how excited and uh, like a genuine expression of like this is a really uh, important moment or this is a really interesting moment whereas now it's like selfies yeah everybody has them you know everybody's doing them everyone does it every day so it's just this like oversaturation I guess that that maybe takes it away from it 
It could be a combination of a lot of things. You know, I'm going to say it's not just that. It's not just the fact that everybody has phones, but I think it also has to do with uh, capitalism, right? It has to do with the fact that uh, everybody's just trying to make money off of themselves or, or off of their pictures or off of themselves. And a lot of times it's just having to do like photo after photo of themselves and, um, you know, just competing with other people or just not see uh, not putting themselves out there in a genuine way to get shut down you know not putting themselves out there capturing genuine moments uh, because they're too scared of how people are going to react to those genuine moments so they put on really fake emotions and really fake uh, photos of themselves to just counterbalance that quote unquote uh, so and then everybody's seeing that and everyone's replicating it so I think it just becomes that, you know, the ripple effect of all this stuff kind of um, took away this beautiful element that you see in these photos, in these paintings. And once again, and this same thing here, like just looking at her face, it really is a very um, um, serene kind of vibe to it very calming and relaxed and um in tune person uh beautiful colors again i think it's very cool what the color of the background i don't know if that was actually what the apartment looked like which i'm gonna bet and say yes uh those were um, color choices that people had uh frequently for like walls and stuff it wasn't all just white and also really like the pattern of um, the drapes, the window drapes, um, and the flowers, the brightness, uh, the bright orange, with which complements the uh, apron that she's wearing. And then uh, the window having like yellow to it, which also complements the yellow on the dishes. So compositionally excellent, right? Beautiful work. Um, but uh, yeah, overall, I'm gonna say it's just the combination of that, like beautiful colors and capturing emotion um, and composition. It really nailed it. And also style, like it's very stylized. I wanna say it's, it's um, kind of in the same realm of like Van Gogh, right? Van Gogh used very brilliant colors and uh, there was like very stylistic elements to them. So I think like the checkered uh, this checkered drapes combined with these like vibrant colors and also these um, not your typical color choices of purple or blue so it's like that teal and purple combined together uh, along with these bright ones and the dark blue or purple of the, the checkered drapes uh, makes for a very interesting stylized painting I really enjoy that Here's another one. I, I don't think this is oil. I'm going to say this is pastel or gouache. Um, but I could be wrong. It could be an oil painting. Uh, it just doesn't... The texture suggests otherwise. But I thought it was very cool. I thought it was a very stylized drawing as well. Like the length of her neck. It looks very exaggerated. Um, of course, the background as well. I'm not really sure what's going on over there. If she's sitting behind like... Um, some sort of wall that has this pattern or if that's supposed to be the sky and he just turned it into uh, like a pattern of some sort right like an abstract sort of pattern uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it's the well, ladder I'm gonna say it's the ladder um, but again very brilliant colors right that per that orange is very bright along with that yellow which again goes to the idea of where uh, Gil Elvgren probably got his inspiration and um, desire to, to pop out his colors more. Also very soft choices too, like in comparison to let's say Gil Elvgren's women, like you see very defined lines for uh, all the exterior parts of the body and figure and face and all that stuff and the features whereas you see here there's like a bit of a halo effect i want to say um around everything 
you know, around the face, around the uh, shoulders especially, you could see that. And I really like it. It adds a, a kind of like a dreamy sort of element to it, right? It has, um, and what I really like about this painting is kind of um, this cosmic element to it. It looks like there are a bunch of stars in the background and she's out in space, sort of, because she, uh, her... Her body suggests otherwise, you know, that she's somewhere in a bright lit room. So it's this like juxtaposition of like the light that source that's on her, but yet being in a background of something so dark. And I don't know if those dots are there because of age of the painting, you know, just like aged that way, but it kind of looks like stars. So it's a cool combination and it has this very fantastic element to it. Um, and, and again, this like uh, the, the halo effect of his paintings kind of um, add to that. And, and the same thing with like the previous painting, like this, this painting as well, there's like a halo effect to it. So it has this like dream quality to it. But um, great way of using colors again, I really like the um, expression of her fingers and her hands. And I really like her face expression. Uh, same same element, very kind face. And a uh, very soothing, sort of relaxed um, expression. And here's another one, which is very different, I'm gonna say. Like, the softness of his lines aren't as present here. You can see it's very defined, which kind of gets closer to what Gil Elfgren was doing. So you could see that like bright, bright red in the background. Um, and I liked, I actually really liked the pattern in the top, um, top right corner. It adds um, like, I guess style to it, right? It adds style to the entire drawing. Um, it has like a very designerly sort of uh, feel to it. And I want to say that's, kind of like graphic design-ish vibes. Like I want to say similar to the other painting where you saw the drapes having checkered pattern to them and combined with those like very vibrant colors. Um, I'm going to say he has a very uh, graphic design element to him. Um, but I, I also really like this one because of his color choices and the face expression. He really... Uh, he really captured her, I guess, suspicion, or she's either suspicious or she's caught in the act of doing something. One of those. And then here is another one. Um, I really like this one because it combines, it looks like um, art noir kind of. It has that element to it. Um, and it captures like the style of the 1920s, the independent woman of the 1920s. You know, the very um, self-assured and confident um, woman who's very successful, who doesn't really need um, to play herself down in any way in order to get through. It looks like she's well established and well aware of herself, uh, which I really like. I like this, uh, this photo or painting rather, uh, to demonstrate it. And I like the color choices that he had, like just around her body, uh, on the left side from that blue all the way down to like a purple, I'm going to say, um, it's just a very cool reflective light that, that really gives uh, the painting uh, an, an interesting vibe. If you were to remove that, I think it would just be a little bit more of a, your typical painting. Still beautiful, but just adding those accent colors on there um, really pop it out and make it, make it look uh, very stylized as well. Um, so that pretty much does it, y'all. This is going to be the first half of the special intro. Um, as I thought, whoa, it really went over. So this is like, it took up the entire stream. I didn't even do any of the project uh, work, but well worth it. It's a lot of fun for me. I hope it is as much uh, fun for you guys 
um, to just observe their work and um, to notice all these beautiful details about them and uh, really appreciate all their their effort and how much um, how much they pioneered how much they inspired other artists as well uh, and it's always inspiring for me to take a look at it and, and just enjoy um, their their work their efforts um, so if you guys also enjoyed this content remember to hit the like and subscribe button and I will continue with the second half of the first uh, special intro I guess of this um, of Gil Elf Grin there's gonna be many more to come I'm gonna try to um, I'm gonna try to keep them as close uh, to each other as possible but I can't promise considering you know I got other projects that I have to do so I, I, it, it, it makes it difficult for me to squeeze out more time to put it to compile all this stuff together um, but you guys can always check the, these out they're in the histories they're in the um, uh, video section so if you head over to the video section you filter based off of collections you guys will see the highlights folder and over there I post where I upload all of the special intros, special outros. So you guys can always uh, skip back to catch up with uh, the previous special intro for Gil Elfgren in the future. I um, wanted to say thank you to all of the subscribers on YouTube. Uh, this is also dedicated to you guys. It's, uh, it's great to see you guys enjoying the content. Uh, it's also a celebration of a hundred subscribers, which I'm very excited about and want to express my sincere, uh, gratitude. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, glad you guys are taking it in and I'm glad you're, uh, you're into it as much as I am. And there'll be more content, uh, to come of course, towards the future. Um, and that pretty much does it everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Hope you guys have a great weekend and I will see you next week.